Okay, everybody, we're starting uh, tonight's uh, talk. It's still daytime in uh, much of the world, uh, especially where our speaker is calling us from. I believe it's in Texas. But uh, wherever you are in the Western Hemisphere, good uh, day to you. Wherever you are in the Eastern Hemisphere, good evening to you. Thank you for joining us. I see there are some people who are up in, uh, in the countries as far as uh, Singapore, where it's well after uh, midnight. I'm happy that some of my students from uh, Yale and from Boston College are here as well tonight. So I'm happy to see familiar faces uh, as well as all of you. All of you are welcome. Uh, please remember to uh, type your names uh, as well as your affiliation uh, when you are asking uh, questions so that I can relay the information to Dr. Neda. Uh, tonight we have a sold out event. We have over 240 confirmations. Uh, the only event that came this close is I think uh, Her Excellency Noor al kabi the Minister of Culture, of the UAE, so, so it's quite a sold out event. Uh, without further uh, ado, I'd like to introduce uh, my colleague, uh, Suhaila Taqesh, who is the curator of the Barjil Art Foundation. And Suhaila uh, will be introducing uh, our speaker. Uh, and this is a, um, a custom of the Majlis where I ask someone else to introduce our speaker. So I hope to continue this uh, going forward. Uh, Suhaila, uh, the floor is yours and you may introduce our speaker. Thank you, Sultan, and thank you also for continuing to host these events and bringing the community together every week. I could not be more excited to be introducing today's speaker, Nada Shabut. Uh, Nada, as many of you know, is not only an expert on modern Arab art, but also through her efforts in writing, teaching, speaking, uh, documenting, organizing people, um, I think she has made, uh, she has helped the field uh, as such to make big strides both in the museum world and in academia and in many ways sort of putting modern Arab art on the map, so to speak. Um, I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say that probably virtually everyone in the field has in some ways been impacted by Nada's work. Uh, her list of accomplishments is far too extensive for me to do justice in the time that we have, so I'll just give you the tip of the iceberg. Um, in 2007, Nada published this book called Modern Arab Art, Formation of Arab Aesthetics, and it was really the first effort of its kind to take this historical and theoretical approach to the subject and has um, really laid the foundations for the work of many future researchers. Uh, more recently, Nada co-edited this volume uh, of primary documents from the Arab world that was released by MoMA in 2018 and has sort of like become a Bible in the field. <laughs> uh, Nada is a professor of art history at the University of North Texas, where she also leads the Contemporary Arab, Muslim, uh, Arab and Muslim Cultural Studies Initiative. She is the co-founder and uh, president of AMCA, the Association of Modern and Contemporary Art from the Arab World, Iran, and Turkey. For those of you who are unfamiliar with their work, uh, do check it out online and consider becoming a member. Nada also leads a project called the Modern Art Iraq Archive, which is uh, a website that I've spent a lot of time on, and um, it's really an effort to document Iraq's modern artistic heritage, uh, including helping to locate the whereabouts of lost works after, 2013, uh, after 2003, um, I apologize. Um, and it's just an incredible collection of material online. You have images, catalogs, journals, it's a real treasure trove. Nada, welcome. Uh, we are so excited to hear you speak today. Thank you so much, Suhaila, for your generous introduction. Um, but also thank you really, Sultan, for continuing this cultural majlis online. I think it is even more needed now than ever. And I'm always happy to participate in any of your initiatives. Um, equally, we can talk about, you know, how Sultan has been impacting the field um, recently. So, and I am so um, honored to have that many participants in the Zoom. A lot of, I was sort of scrolling through the names, uh, seeing a lot of, you know, um, uh, old friends and former students and um, hopefully new um, um, uh, uh, friends that I can uh, do and you know, have in the, in the future. Okay, so 
um, I think um, uh, I was just thinking earlier that, you know, the good morning, good afternoon, good evening may not work anymore because of where we are in the world. So we need some other form of greetings. So, salamu alaikum seems to be a very appropriate one. Okay, I now will share um, my uh, presentation, uh, which to be honest is going, oh, but then you know what, Sultan, you need to enable my sharing. Once you took okay. over. We, we yeah. did that, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, what I am uh, planning to talk about <clears throat> today in the format of the topic of, um, hold on one second, can't walk and chew gum at the same time, I guess. Where is the, oh, here we go. All right. <clears throat> um, and, can't have my notes. All right. So what I am sorry, I'm going too fast. Um, the topic of today, writing art history, archiving and the Arab world is pretty much like um, Sohaila actually um, uh, sort of charted is the story of my career and is the story of my of the field of modern Arab art, particularly. It's kind of, and, and you know, as I was thinking this morning of how to really uh, make this topic accessible and talk about highlights, you know, the issue of archiving specifically, I um, came across a posting uh, on Facebook to just now by Sultan, which um, <clears throat> had a really interesting quote uh, from the archival material from Sudan. I um, had, a, had it actually extracted, but now I can't see it because I can you know, only do one thing, I guess, on, um, on the screen. But it talked about how archives tell a story, at least bits of a story. And this is how this whole thing started. <clears throat> Initially, um, as I sort of you know, started um, uh, graduate school and decided to move from the world of architecture where I started to the world of art history, I realized that A, the history that I was taught in the US and the UK um, of art and architecture did not include any uh, places outside of, let's say, a history of architecture is focused on Italy, uh, Rome, and Florence. And then, you know, if we talk to them uh, on the modern, then we're moving to Paris. And then the history of art, you know, it's sort of a, a very Western Euro American uh, focus. But as someone who grew up seeing objects of art in Iraq, in Baghdad, in my, my parents' house, in friends' house, I have a wealth of visual images in my head, never knew how to locate them, never knew really what uh, influenced my, see, my, my vision of color. I wanted to know more about it. And so <clears throat> to try to figure out as a student, what, what program to go, go into meant that I needed to A, convince um, art history um, in, in the United States uh, academia that uh, modern Arab art is a topic um, because, you know, initially I was told you either go Islamic art or you go Middle Eastern studies. There's no such thing um, as modern Arab art. I'm, I'm talking, of course, you know, this is early 1990s. So it's the last century. Um, and some of you may have not even been born by then. But um, so I had to fight. The challenge was a convincing um, art history department that I want to study modernism in the Arab world in an art history program um, and that this is not Islamic art. Um, but then also once I managed to accomplish that is then um, with, with the lack of having any so, sort of advisors who would guide me through, where do I find uh, resources? And what methodologies do I follow? This kind of continued as um, through, you know, my, uh, my graduate work into um, graduating and then teaching. How do I teach the topic? How do I teach my students? Where are the resources? And again, what are the methodologies? It's a story that sort of, you know, continued, but then really got exasperated with the um, uh, 2003 invasion of Iraq. Now, as um, someone who is originally from Iraq and wanting to study the visual art of Iraq, I had no access to it during the 1990s because of sanctions. Um, and then, you know, in 2003, 
when I was able to, to go, uh, and I did go to Baghdad in June 2003, I saw the level of destruction to the point that, you know, specifically following the sanctions, that the, the story of modernism of visual production in Iraq was lost by then. Even this, and what you're seeing is Marka Saddam Lil Fanoon, um, which is now the National Museum of Modern Art um, in Iraq, um, was um, uh, bombed and um, or there was a fire um, and there was a sort of mega looting and um, the archives disappeared from the museum as well. As it was, the archives were really not um, exactly that much useful because there were lists of works of art with <clears throat> names of artists and titles that may or may not even really correspond to the work and no images, but it was a list for us to know what was in the museum and <clears throat> you know, what we can um, try to figure out. So my efforts of documenting this lost history, because then it became an issue of not only um, archives, but uh, erasure of, um, um, of heritage, cultural heritage destruction and erasure of collective memory. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's allergy season in Texas and it's kind of morning for me. Um, so um, the destruction meant that there was an urgency. I mean, there was a, initially an urgency so we can write the story, but now there's an urgency because the story is disappearing. The object of the story is disappearing. This is around the time when, um, um, particularly late first decade of the 21st century and um, early uh, uh, second decade, where archives became really uh, popu popular. Um, they were objects of arts, but they also sort of started becoming documents of use. I think there was an archive craze. I was so often um, uh, asked, what do you think of archives or what do you do with archives? And as an art historian, of course, archives to me are only documents that tell something else. In themselves, they are voices of the past. And then the interpretation is really what we do with archives. <clears throat> but we also realize the problem because of the rarity of archives in the Arab world um, and in accessibility that whoever graduate students particularly and schol young scholars were kind of hoarding their archives. They did not want to share archives because, you know, this, this almost it felt like a, you know, um, uh, you know, so some sort of journalistic um, uh, story that can you know, come out of it. So, they're, you know, multiplied by um, then, you know, the, the uh, problematic of the writing of art history, where we actually do need the archives for the writing. <clears throat> In a way, all of this kind of, you know, uh, motivated and directed the many projects that Suhaila um, talked about. And in fact, this is what I'm going to do, this sort of, you know, all connected um, uh, stories of uh, archiving and writing um, and documenting and then mapping are all kind of connected and they all sort of form this idea of what is a field, which um, as Suhaila said was non-existent to be honest when I, when I started uh, my journey. Luckily we've changed. So I'm showing you some images of the works that have been in the museum, were in the museum, and were lost um, for now. And you can see works from 1920s, work from 1930s. The idea that, you know, this um, particularly modernism, because, you know, after 2003, everyone spoke of the ancient um, heritage, um, the humanities heritage, Mesopotamia's heritage of, you know, its heritage of the whole world, but no one really cared about modernism. In fact, every time I gave a talk about the Museum of Modern Art, someone would say, I think they have made a mistake in the invitation because, you know, clearly you're going to be talking about the ancient uh, museum. And they would be surprised when I say, well, actually, no, I'm going to, to, to talk about the Museum of Modern Art. And guess what? Yes, you know, Iraq is a country that is alive, it's contemporary. And so, of course, they have contemporary artists, um, as well as they had modernism. But because we have the stigma of the connection of modernism in um, the Arab world with national identity, um, it has become uh, a political 
an ideological um, uh, issue for many people. Like, what do you do with the heritage of the 1970s, 80s, uh, and 90s in Iraq under the rule of the Ba'ath and Saddam? Is it tainted? You know, do we want to look at it or not? When a, a museum was called Markel Saddam Lil Finun, it already has that, that stigma with it. So you're seeing images of some of the works that I have um, in my, my journey in 2003, saw in um, a room with no electricity and no um, uh, environment control at the Hiwar Gallery, um, which is, you know, uh, uh, the result of effort of Iraqi artists going around and trying to um, collect what they can, because you would see um, images like this, where there are loads of these works of modern art on trucks. And someone offered me um, a load, two load, two trucks load of work if I had $5,000 in cash to give him. And Baghdad in June to, um, 2003 <clears throat> was an impossibility. Um, and so, you know, the, the problem, of course, the crime is then when you have works like this one, uh, the Farq Hassan um, uh, Kurds of the 1950s that shows up on the black market, but you can't even um, help Interpol to intercept because the government has not um, uh, issued a list of what has been stolen or, you know, the, the control over it. Um, so then you, you know, inevitably just lose track of even um, where these works have gone. At the beginning, um, a lot of people would send me images and tell me that, you know, they have um, uh, seen these works in New York, in London, other places, and these are um, examples of works that, for example, showed up in Amman, in Jordan, and as you can see at the back, um, it's kind of a, a sort of really sloppy attempt to hide the seal of Marqa Saddam, which is one of the ways we can, you know, in the law, in the, in the um, uh, absence of an archive and any other sort of government documentation, there are very few things that we can use to um, uh, uh, you know, guide us through it. So this is a, a, you know, a problem that never stopped and continues, and that led me to start the Modern Art Iraq Archive to document the lost collection from the museum, but then slowly grew into something else. Um, actually, it was a, um, and this is why I love my students, and I never, or you know, all those scho young scholars that I mentor, and I never let you go, is um, Salim Behlouli, for example, who was just starting his uh, uh, PhD at, uh, um, Stanford came to me and said, what if we also include uh, digital text? If we go around, try to digitize text, which of course was a great idea. And we did that. And that sort of kind of, you know, led us to the Modern Art Iraq Archive, um, where you can sort of go surf through either some of the images. And it's a long story that I don't have time to tell you how I found some of those images. But you know, and, and it's contested continuously. And so that's why I protect myself legally and say probably fr uh, from the lost collection. But also there was, you know, all kinds of other documentations that we are able to upload. This site is, continues to be a project in, in progress, um, lacking funding at the moment. But, you know, it was, what was great about this is that um, people sort of contacted me and said, we have this material and started sort of, you know, um, sending me material that I'm able to upload. But, you know, the digital age is great with this because nostalgia has meant that anyone who has any document is digitizing it, uploading it on Facebook of all places. I mean, I'm on Facebook all the time because it's a research resource for, for me. But this also led us to um, the, uh, the sort of, you know, trying to document, build a field, led us to create this association of um, uh, modern contemporary art from the Arab world, Iran and Turkey, AMCA, uh, which has various initiatives for all of you who are not, not familiar with it. I'm going to sort of, you know, do a, a, a sort of plug-in ad, please become a member, because this is your way of connecting to the field. There is a Randa Saad Prize for Best Graduate Paper in Modern Contemporary Arab Art. We have the Anthem uh, Modern Contemporary Art of the Arab World Iran Turkey um, series, where we publish um, specific um, um, short, small books um, on the bi biography of a work of art, uh, specifically um, people, you know, various scholars write reviews. We <clears throat> uh, host conferences, one of which was um, uh, generously funded by um, uh, Sultan and the Bergil Art Foundation. And um, we, you know, we, we kind of participate in various other um, 
conferences like College Art Association, Middle East Study Association, which all sort of, of, of whom we are affiliates here in the US, which all sort of, you know, led to the idea of making this field acknowledged, accessible, concrete. And that also then led to more archiving. So in the 90s, when I was doing my graduate research, um, in a way, I mean, there's sort of like, you know, the positive and negative. It was when I contacted any of the artists, um, they gave me everything they had because they had, they were just so um, you know, happy that someone is looking, um, uh, talking to them, that they gave me material easily. I didn't really have to do a lot of digging. But also realized then, and with the sort of, you know, the limited material that I have, there was a mainstream narrative of what is modern Arab art that is being um, uh, sort of uh, promoted. And we've had in the, you know, 1997, there was the uh, Ujdan Hashimi, Ujdan Ali's book of um, uh, modern Islamic art, which I, um, of course, um, have a, a specific ideological um, uh, conflict with, but there were uh, the exhibitions that Salwa Maqdadi um, uh, hosted, and there was sort of the, the second narrative that you know, people like the late Kamal Bulata, you know, wrote, and that guided us through to some extent, but again, and very much kind of confirmed a specific mainstream narrative, but also we realized that we only have excerpts of you know certain um, uh, text that is essential and so hence the project of uh, modern art in the Arab world primary documents which you know had a, a sort of a long evolution but in its um, uh, uh, manifestation included ma uh, manifestos and the declarations by artists we wanted to hear the voice of artists we wanted to know what the artists are saying and in many ways it added new um, ways for us to look at this material. There are so, you know, there was like sort of this mega, which is very modernist, okay? We wrote a mega narrative of what is modern Arab art, and that now it's time to unpack and write these smaller stories, the smaller narratives that, in fact, they lead in, in the big story. They kind of, you know, tell us then where we went wrong or not in the big story, but they allow us to know more and more details. And I'm happy to say, you know, the students who are doing the work, I mean, Suhaila's work on Mahmoud Sabri, for example, is, is a, a good example, that this sort of small um, little narratives, they kind of make us understand that modernism was not an alternative or, you know, um, a, a, a uh, uh, directed, uh, diver what is the word, um, der derivative modernism uh, from European modernism, but rather we just had the story wrong. We just need to understand how European modernism was formed and how the colonies, um, you know, were part of that, that formulation. And we are only able to know that um, and figure that out through looking at the little details. Now, this book is not uh, exhaustive or, uh, you know, uh, uh, exclusive, um, uh, in rather inclusive of everything that was um, being produced, but it had, because it followed a format that MoMA had as well, but it also made us um, find um, full text and translate it in an accessible way. And, you know, like for, an for example, even now, and while we did all of this with the um, understanding that I wanted to use this for teaching, because like I said, you know, me as a student is one issue and then teaching is a whole other issue. My students just as recently asked me, um, what is plastic arts? Why is this text have this sort of term plastic arts? And it's something we debated, you know, Annika um, Lentz and Sarah uh, Rogers and I debated with all the consultants that we had in the book. <clears throat> it is the term finun teshkiliya that the Arabic, you know, the Arab used. Now, most likely it is translated from the French, um, finun, you know, we have finun tatbiqiyya, finun teshkiliya, and so then it translates into English into plastic um, arts. Now, I'm really not sure if, you know, it has any, I mean, it's, it is part of modernism, the notion of the plasticity of the form, but, you know, and so it kind of applied then, but I'm not sure that it would may, make a big difference if we just said visual arts, to be honest, or even fine arts as, you know, um, the sort of uh, the, the, uh, the term that was used uh, mostly. But trying to connect 
<clears throat> these works with certain texts and the story of how this moment happened. Now, at least for me, it's making me relax a bit. Think, okay, now I can start to look at the small stories and say, let me look at the 1958, for example, you know, in Iraq. What specifically, how did people engage? What the artists, what were the artists doing? So it allows me to start looking at the particularities of the stories of, you know, what formed this sort of idea when we talk about, and you know, this book, Modern Art in the Arab World, was specific. It is about the Arab sort of, you know, um, uh, cultural um, uh, overlap moment, which is at one point of time kind of, you know, aligns itself with the political, but really not. And so um, it's so it's it, when you start writing these stories, when you start finding these evidence, then you can start having debates about what do we mean by Arab? art? What is Arab in the, in the idea of Arab art? How do we look at what was happening in Iraq or what was happening in um, the UAE or what was hap happening in Egypt <clears throat> as part of this larger story? They all kind of also tell us that when we hear media celebrating um, the Arab Spring because the Arabs are in the street, you know, and they're making art, we can say that, you know, this is, this, there's a, a, a history, there is a tradition. It's not something new. They didn't just start making uh, art, but rather, you know, there is a, um, something to fall onto. I tell you one of the things that I start kind of, you know, I, I wrote Modern Arab Art um, uh, Formation of Arab Aesthetic book based on the rupture with the Islamic mostly, something that I am currently reevaluating. I think that in my sort of haste to try to, to prove that this is not Islamic art and we can't talk about a continuation of Islamic art, maybe I did um, kind of, you know, uh, miss certain points. And I'm going to end, I am aware of time, and I know no one is timing me, but because I would like to have a conversation with everyone, um, and I can elaborate on any of this, <clears throat> any other questions, I want to end at this note. So when we then start thinking about writing art history of the region and of the countries, we equally need to think about what does art history mean in these places of the world? We seem, you know, I mean, um, there's this sort of, you know, popular notion, is art history global? Um, you know, James Elkin's sort of uh, uh, famous book and, and the various le lectures he gave, is art history global? And of course, we all want to jump and say, of course it is. You know, we make art, artists make art, then art history is global. But the reality is, <clears throat> what does it mean in different parts of the world? So, Amka, in collaboration with um, the Getty Foundation, are, have, are about to initiate this project, which is you know, sort of this summer was going to be a major production of it. But clearly now, um, a lot of things have to change as we are not able to travel around the region uh, collecting data. But this is a call for all of you who are um, here to see if you can help us with collecting this data. We want to know what programs of art history exist in any of these countries, what universities, what alternative formats of art history are, um, are being um, uh, formed from, you know, through, I mean, we want the past and we want the contemporary as well, because there is a different change, you know, you know, the, the colonial, post-colonial and the neo-colonial um, all kind of lead into a uh, different interpretation of what art history is, but we want to collect the data. We want to make it um, available on a website, on an interactive uh, map, as a matter of fact, in the region where, <clears throat> A, we want to kind of, again, the, the, you know, refute this notion as we did, what, there is no uh, modern Arab art, there is no contemporary Arab art, there is no art history in the Arab world. We want to come to a conclusion one way or the other. We also want the region to be able to say what they want. I mean, when we formed AMCA, our hope was to connect with the region, but the connection was, you know, not not as, as easy or as smooth as we would have liked it to be. I think digitally today, maybe we have a better choice. So um, we, I want to sort of take advantage of that. I guess, you know, my whole professional career has been moments of me taking advantage of what politics is doing and uh, pushing scholarship through that. 
we all have to be strategists at some point. But so this is a moment where we want to collect this data, make it available. So all of you researchers are able to access that. It's the same thing that we did with the, uh, the, the MoMA uh, sort of book. It's the same thing that, you know, we're, um, um, we did with the, the Maya website. It's making this information accessible. You know, we seem to think that <clears throat> I am writing this book about this artist. You know, think about how many books are there about Cubism, Picasso, Brock, or Impressionism. And there are new, new theses, new dissertations, new graduate students who are working on this topic. For us to have two books on Jawad Salim is uh, not enough. So because, you know, again, we need to move away from the meta sort of narrative of the story of Jawad Salim and start re-evaluating all these words. You know, Jabra Ibrahim Jabra, someone who wrote, um, he was a friend, he was a contemporary, and he wrote about Jawad. So what we're, we need to sort of look at that material again. You know, and, and do we really see that? Does it even transfer? You know, is it, is it something that still makes sense in today's age? We know more. We have, you know, we have other material and we need to take full advantage of that. All right. I'm going to stop with that. Is that good, Sultan? Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, actually, uh, I want to say two things. First of all, I want to commend you on saying that you are uh, revising ideas that you had and you held in previous years now as you're learning more and developing your thesis. So that is really something that I think we commend you all and we need more examples of that. Um, the second thing is it's not my point, but could you stop sharing your presentation so we can have a larger uh, image of yes. you? Uh, the second thing I, I wanna say is, yeah, of course, and thank you for publish, for writing for both our books at Barjil. We really appreciate it, uh, both these publications. And the final thing I was gonna say is that, uh, the primary documents uh, book, everybody, the primary documents book that Neda and a team of stellar scholars worked on in the past um, a few years, and I think it was, came out two years ago, is now available to be downloaded uh, for free on the Thank MoMA you. website. Yeah. So you go on the MoMA website under publications and you have that book. I will hand over the mic now to Melissa uh, Gronland. Melissa Gronland is a uh, journalist with the uh, national uh, newspaper here in Abu Dhabi. Melissa, you're uh, unmuted and you're spotlighted. Go ahead. Um, Nada, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, it's such a joy to hear you speak under any circumstances, even COVID. Um, I, I actually, the question I wanted to ask you was something that you gestured to at the end of the talk, which is about um, the data points between art histories in the Arab world and um, art history methodologies in the US world. I mean, that's something that I think because I don't speak Arabic, I can never get a sense of how much um, Arabic, scholar Arabic scholarship exists on these artists um, in the Arab world, but also um, in what ways their methodologies and the ways they think about art histories differ. And, and I think that was something that you were starting to say that you were collecting data points on. Um, but you know, that's always such a, um, a, a question that's laced with you know, histories of colonialism, having these US um, departments then retelling the story of, of, of Arab art histories. So I was wondering if I could get you to expand on that a little. So, I mean, um, thank you, Melissa, and so good to see you. Um, and, you know, it's really, ha I'm happy to see a lot of faces and I missed Dubai in March this year. So um, one of the issues is also an issue of translation. This is something that we really uh, felt and understood um, uh, despite, you know, so, and the reality is my both co-editors and, and um, a lot of the, the um, uh, scholars um, in, the, in, in the field, uh, particularly as, as you saw, all of my efforts to build this field have been mostly here in the US. And so I am very aware that this is a US-based initiative um, uh, that is trying to reach beyond. And so methodologies is an issue. And I'm trained here. And everyone else is trained in this methodologies. The reality is why we starting this mapping um, uh, the uh, art history in the Arab world, Iran, Turkey, is because when the Getty Foundation came to me and wanted to connect with art history in the Arab world, I said, you know, I don't really know where to send you. I don't want to send you to AUB uh, or AUC because, or even, you know, um, um, NYU Abu Dhabi, because this has, um, um, uh, uh, this is something that um, uh, already has, uh, it's, it's accessible and people know. 
that I want to know more about what is there and what is available. And so we started this, this project. But there is a, um, uh, there are publications in Arabic. The problem is that, you know, mostly they were published by ministries, um, limited edition, given out, no ISBN numbers that we can kind of locate. Although they do show up in a lot of the um, university libraries, um, on Amazon, um, on Facebook. So we're able to access some of these um, um, underground um, uh, bookshops, there's such a thing, um, black market bookshops. So, um, so we find them. But then again, you know, you have to then sort of separate between the ideology and, you know, the Ministry of, of Information in Iraq published a lot of books on Iraq. And so they're all sort of celebratory, but they give us details that we can take and, you know, into something else. So there is that, there is the issue of translating the text, but also um, understanding these nuances when you translate. For example, in 2003, when I went to, to Baghdad, I went with a team of scholars who were US-based scholars. Um, and I um, translated a lot for them, but I always, it kind of confirmed also something I understood. What many of the artists or many of the people that we were talking to were saying in English was not exactly what they were saying in Arabic. So there is sort of like the, you know, the, those we are, the, in the family and, and those people outside of the family and what can we tell them and how do we tell them because and, and I think this is also exasperated with by the fact that we are always in a position of defense because we want to define and defend our existence as equal so we kind of think that we should always share we will we will tell them what they want to hear and this seems to be a problem when we come to translate because to what extent do I really trust these words that are being published here knowing other things for example that's why find you know talking to um, our modernists the older artists and recording that you know oral history is important understanding also that of course memory has changed because of time but it is it gives us you know it, it's a lot of sort of detective work and this is really what art history is all about as you well know is that you know you're sort of looking through all this material to find possibilities of stories and we need to know that there need to be more than one story it's okay to have conflicting stories as well because no one knows even the people who were living then, you know, um, would have different uh, memories of, of things. And so we need to be open to the idea that A, um, there can be more than one story. I could be wrong, it's okay to be wrong. And that's why, you know, um, revisiting my theories. I mean, there, there is, uh, for me, um, Sultan was um, commenting on that. Um, when I hear people saying about any book that I'm involved in becoming a Bible, um, I guess the, the MoMA book is fine because we went to a lot of trouble to remain neutral and not give opinion. Of course, it's really difficult not to. But in modern Arab art, you know, um, of course, it's all about my opinion. And so, but I've changed my opinion about things. So now I'm always afraid of even assigning it in my classes until I finish writing this next book that I'm working on, <clears throat> which will revise some of them. Um, uh, what I had said in the first book, but also ta sort of, you know, tackles the issue of methodology, which Melissa, as you were um, asking uh, more, because uh, we are very aware that the methodologies in art history that we follow are Euro-American methodologies that apply to modern art, for example, in uh, Europe. And we're try trying to translate that. And that may, you know, that's a very tricky thing. Uh, Dr. Ola, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to have to ask you to make your answers shorter because yeah. I have so many questions. So let's, I, I know this is difficult and Joseph Masad once told me that he refuses to, uh, to abide by, by dictatorial uh, uh, announcements. Uh, I, uh, please make your answers uh, shorter. Um, there's a question here from, uh, there's a suggestion from Charles Polkak who says that there's so many um, PhD dissertations and MA dissertations, it would be great to have them published one day, perhaps, uh, of course, uh, if the quality is good. Uh, there's a question from Antonia Carver of uh, Jamil Art Center, who says, do you believe that the there are pros and cons uh, influence of the increase in interest in modern art? Has this impacted on the scholarship and awareness of modern art 
uh, is this a good thing or a bad thing? But please, under one minute. Sure, sure. yes. Um, for Charles, uh, uh, for Charlie, I mean, you know, we encourage our graduate students to publish. Um, work with your advisors and get your work published as soon as you can. Uh, Antonia, yes, it has impacted for the good of the bad. So, you know, while I, unlike Joseph Massad, I um, will not say that I won't abide by dictatorial. I have learned to find ways around it. So, and this is what I've done with this sort of increased interest in, um, uh, in the contemporary, to be honest, not the modern. At first it was the contemporary. And Antonia, you're one of the people who brought the modern into uh, Dubai because you knew it was lacking and because the contemporary was sort of taking over with no roots. And so it gave an urgency for modernism to push scholarship. The fear is always of this sort of quick publications. Um, you know, academic publication takes a couple of years before they come out. There's a lot of peer reviewing. And so the, the coffee uh, book uh, um, uh, sort of, you know, uh, craze that happened, great, good images, but the scholarship, you know, is kind of scary because it's not um, edited. Okay, so uh, the other person I'd like to uh, welcome is a fellow Iraqi author, who's the Dr. Ahmed Naji Saeed, who's the author of Under the Palm Trees, Modern Iraqi Art with Mohammed Makia uh, and Jawad Salim. Uh, Ahmed, uh, you're unmuted and you're spotlighted. Tfadl, so Alec. Thank you, Nada. Good to see you. It's always a pleasure to listen to you. You're such a, you know, uh, a source of uh, pride and, and uh, inspiration for many many Iraqis including myself um, I just wanted to ask you quickly I know I, I have many questions as always but I'm just gonna limit it to uh, maybe uh, the top two so one of the things that it, obviously you started this uh, field of uh, uh, documenting or recreating the museum uh, in Iraq and its archives and tracing uh, the photographs etc and uh, there has been two documents that are published by people who worked in the Ministry of Culture after 2003. One is the Red List by Salam Ata Sabri, and there was a, another book uh, which was you know, uh, a much larger in terms of its scope. Uh, but both of these have lots of questions in terms of their legitimacy, in terms of their methodology, etc. So if you could just you know, comment on these and uh, and whether these are uh, have any value at all, or at least in the scope of art history, what are the point of these uh, fake red lists, or maybe not so red? Uh, the other question <coughs> is to do with um, again historical narratives, but they're from local historians inside Iraq. Have you worked, collaborated? Do you trust any of the voices that are still inside Iraq? Those who are uh, teaching in the Academy of Fine Art in the Institute, or for example, uh, people who are uh, known for their um, uh, a great contribution to Iraqi art and literature, for example, uh, like Mayim Adhafa. So you could just comment on these two. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, Ahmed. Always good to see you too. Um, and thank you for your work in, you know, helping with uh, in the, all of these efforts. So. Um, two things, yeah, the Red List and the bigger book, which by the way, I actually, I do have both. And the big book, um, funny story, Sultan, was actually brought to you uh, in Sharjah, but I stole it. So, um, you know, if you, <laughs> um, but yes, they are, I mean, ideologically, they were um, just specifically the Red List, you know, was published by money from the American embassy. Although, you know, I am, I am, you know, very selective in how um, I think about, dirty money, it's okay, you know. Um, but um, they have problems. I mean, there's a Picasso work in the red list listed as Jawad Salim. That is so telling of so many, you know, um, issues. But what they are useful in the sense that, you know, they give us a another layer of cross-referencing. And this is what we do. We, I collect all material, um, try to not judge the material um, by its source and where it's coming from, but understand while I'm deciphering that material that I need to be aware of that. So don't accept anything as a fact, but that's what you do as a scholar. You don't accept anything as a fact. And that so also kind of applies to the voices which are really important um, from the local voices, whether they are the faculty at the academy, which I'm, you know we hope we can connect with more, or people like Maymudafar whose work has been incredibly important to all of us. 
because she not only kind of was documenting and writing from back then when she was involved in all of this, but she also has um, the material and she's been very generous in sharing and documenting and, you know, particularly the work of, of Rafa Nasri, documenting his whole career and, and um, uh, making it accessible um, to people. So, of course, this is very important. But we, as everything else, it has to be unpacked understood within the context it was generated and within this this sort of contemporary context and understand how you can use it to you know help the scholarship the theory this this was a very difficult thing to do with the moma book because even when you know writing these little blurbs uh, blurbs that introduce the text we found ourselves sort of making or passing value judgment and had to retract and try to uh, present them as they were at their time understanding that you know as much as we try to be objective it's not so i mean in various ways you know you have to cross reference a lot of the graduate students work showed us dates that even the artists had them wrong so you know we have to s sort of sift through all of this material and figure it out um, thank you, uh, Doctora. Doctora, uh, your answers are wonderfully elaborate. Uh, I would like to ask... I will shorten them. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, have, we have a question in Arabic now. So uh, the question is from Munira Al-Ahmad. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch to Arabic for three, four minutes. So you guys sure. can do a, a quick coffee break if you don't speak Arabic. The question is from Munira Al-Ahmad, who is a researcher in the field of art and art and art. Arabi. Munira, please, my sister, and ask me. مساء الخير دكتورة شكرا سلطان أول حاجة ومساء الخير دكتورة ندى أما بيك فان أكشولي بس أنا كنت أفضل أن أتكلم بالعربي لأن حسيت أن السؤال شوي ممكن يكون طويل فما راح أطول دائما التوثيق بالفنون العربية تكون من خلال الماضي فأنا وايد أهتم بالفيوتشرست أو الفيوتشرزم فيما يتعلق بالفن العربي فأبي أعرف هل في توثيق مثلا للحاضر الحين يساهم في أنه يحفظ الفن العربي مستقبلا مثلا أنا وايد أهتم بسنة 2050-2100 مثلا which is ممكن يكون انتهاء, انتهاء فن المعاصر وبداية القرن الـ 22 هل في سيناريوهات جاهزة ممكن الواحد يعرفها على أساس أنه إيش مستقبل الفن العربي This is my question, thank you شكرا شكرا لسؤالك uh, طبعا يعني should I answer in Arabic or English بالعربي براحتك okay so I mean الواحد ما يقدر يعني okay إنجليزي معلش أو مخلط يلا you can't predict the future فاحنا ما نقدر نعرف شنو السيناريوهات ما ما ممكن يكون في سيناريوهات جاهزة للمستقبل we can't have um, predictable scenarios for the future but the contemporary الحالي بيوثق الجهود اللي عملها سلطان في البرجيل Art Foundation um, among many others are documenting the contemporary. So they يوثقون المعاصر اللي حاصل. All of you need to be documenting everything. One of my students just reminded me um, in my postmodernism class and they had to do an exhibition and the, the, the students decided to do um, uh, an exhibition about the pandemic. But she was saying how difficult it was to find, the re you know, uh, authenticated resources with the full documentation, the name of the artist and their work from, you know, even the, the AIDS epidemic. And so she was urging everyone who's doing work now, please document them. وَثَّقُوا أَعْمَالْكُمْ الْحَالِيَّةِ وَإِذَا تَعْرَفُونَ فَنَّانِينَ قُلُوا لَهُمْ يَوَثَّقُونَ أَعْمَالْهُمْ الْحَالِيَّةِ لَأَنُّ هَذَا هُوَ الْمُسْتَقْبَلِ اللي حَنَعْرَفُ شِي صِيرِ إنما حالياً نحن جزء من ال ال يعني الحركة الفنية العالمية فكيف هذا راح يكون في المستقبل ما نعرف هل يكون في فن عربي فن أمريكي أو فن فضائي <تصفيق> who knows yeah, this, is, this remains to be seen مشكورة دكتورة أنا I'm ما شاء الله the screen is, is full so it takes me a second to find uh, the people I want to spotlight uh, but I have a question from a former student of mine uh, from Abu Dhabi uh, Jude Al Marar uh, but because, mashallah, the room is full, I have to uh, scroll through uh, several uh, pages. Uh, and I can't find you, Jude. Uh, but Jude, I see Jude. Oh, there she is. There she is. I see Jude. Okay. Uh, Jude, uh, you're unmuted. And you're, oh, you're, your camera's off, but you can ask your question, Jude. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Um, I wasn't Zoom ready to be spotlighted. But my question is, you know, I'm studying um, at the Arab Studies program at Georgetown and we work a lot. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about archiving and, you know, 
the, the issues and the challenges and the pitfalls. And we do face these challenges when we, when we conduct research, especially about you know, resources from the Arab world. Another issue I'd like your point of view on is really, what do you think about all these archival documents which have been you know, taken out of their context during the invasion, during the Arab Spring, many times uh, illegally and are part of Western organizations, sometimes accessible, sometimes not, you know, there is censorship involved in that. So yeah, I, I just wanted to know, what do you think about that topic? Yeah, really interesting. I mean, of course, I understand all your um, uh, challenges and difficulties with uh, trying to find these archives, and we want all these archives. Like, for example, the um, Hoover archives, the Makia uh, archives, just went uh, dark. Um, now they're not accessible anymore um, at Stanford, at the Hoover Institute, because apparently it has sensitive material um, that, um, um, uh, you know, whatever. Um, uh, could cause problems. And so uh, this becomes another problem when there are archives and then they are uh, hidden or they go dark and um, you can't access them until like, I don't know, maybe in 20, 30 years. So removing those archives, I mean, A, we have a problem of trying to explain to our, to the Arab world that these you know, save the, the archives. But of course, the destruction level in Iraq, for example, where a lot of archives were destroyed is one thing um, that shows us that, you know, if you don't have the, the, the capability of even um, saving or sort of preserving what you have, that's a whole other problem. I hear from scholars and, and colleagues who work in India of how difficult it is to, to um, access a lot of the archives there. We all know in, in Cairo, you can go to basements of some government buildings and there are, you know, um, loads and loads of of archives that have not been processed. So this, there is this fear of archives or this maybe, I mean, sacredness to archives. You know, they're either, like I said, it, it, they even became part of the artwork for some of the artists. This, we need to kind of, you know, desynthesize that. We need to be, make archives accessible. Archives are only as, you know, as good as the accessibility to them. If they exist and we can't see them, then they mean nothing. And so I would, you know, urge anyone who has any kind of archive to make it, um, you know, accessible so we can see it. Now, those who, of course, disappear on us, well, we, you know, it becomes a political issue. Archives are always political. Um, thank you so much, Doctora. Doctora, I have a question from Her Excellency Noor Al Kabi, the Minister of uh, Culture and Knowledge Development here in the UAE. She just matched it, messaged it in, and she's asking, What is your dream for art, for the art scene in the Arab world? Oh, well, I'm a, I am honored that, you know, Her Excellency is asking me a question. So thank you very much. My dream for the Arab world, um, art in the Arab world is for it to feel that it is equal to any other art. I still feel that our artists, even our contemporary artists, compete not for who they are and what they are, but rather compete for a larger market that is very controlled by a small art world. So I mean, for artists, I hope they can feel their worth. And for, but for us, for them to feel that, we probably need to make modern, the modern history of our art, as well as you know, any, everything else beyond the modern, um, an equal form of knowledge so they can feel comfortable with it. Uh, thank you, Doctora. We have uh, now uh, the, uh, the artist, the great artist, I should say, uh, Samia Halabi. Uh, Samia, uh, you're unmuted and your uh, spotlight is, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Nanda, first of all, what a pleasure to see you. And uh, I am so pleased and impressed by the scientific attitude you take. Uh, I'm going to ask you a kind of philosophical question that goes to the basics that concerns artists. And uh, I'm going to read what I wrote, so I'd be brief. Um, if we go back to the ABCs of art history, and I'm not talking about anybody's ABCs. They could be yours, mine, anybody's. They could be the Arab world's, what should be our ABCs. What percentage should visual analysis of the artworks themselves uh, and the growth of the visual knowledge and formal language that is in the artworks, what percentage should that analysis be in, in art history itself, you know, should it be 40%, 10%, or is all the other documentation more important? 
Well, I mean, you know, that is a bit of a, um, a difficult philosophical question, Samia. Oh, first, lovely to see you, of course. Um, and thank you for being here. Um, and for all the work that you do, because you yourself have contributed a lot to um, the whole documentation archiving. So, I mean, I, I, I don't know that I can um, think of, you know, I mean, the, the job of art history is to um, not lead, but to follow. Um, and, and write the story of what the artists um, do and what methodologies they follow, um, you know, lead us to think of how we can decipher. So there is some sort of, of course, communication. Um, and we all share the philosophical underpinning because of the age that we're in um, and that why it's, it changes. And so, I mean, um, I think they are in certain way um, distinct roles. And to be honest, you know, the only uh, historians who work on the contemporary know their artists, because remember, everyone else who writes on the Renaissance or, or you know, the medieval or any other age, um, you know, they have no artists to work with. And so the interpretation of the art become, or of the object becomes, um, you know, um, what the, the art history does. So the object becomes the focus. And I think to some extent, we should do the same, whether, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, the modern or the contemporary. I mean, when I look at your work and I talk to you, it's one thing, but then I am more equipped to decipher that you're equipped to create, let's say. And so, you know, the, you know there's a, an overlap in percentage. I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure I can quantify. I don't know if that answers your question, Samia. Sorry, but we can talk about this later. Yes. Uh, Doctora, uh, we have a question next from uh, Lina Ramadan, who's assistant curator at Madhaf in Doha and a PhD student at the Academy of Fine Arts uh, in uh, Vienna. Uh, Lina, you are unmuted and spotlighted. Thank you, Sultan, for introducing me and for organizing this wonderful talk. Nada, the richness of your work and research has informed and shaped many cultural and art practices, as well as art, art institutions. It also influenced the way I personally look and research the collection of Mat'haf, which is the Arab Museum of Modern Art. It's a new, unique and complex collection and your legacy has been kind of, you know, living with us today, today and we kind of keep learning from that experience. One challenge I keep encountering when dealing with topics on Arab modernity and women representation is the absence of narratives and archives that tell stories of these women. My question to you, Nada, is that what are the methodologies and steps that researchers can take to, can take to bridge this gap and also how institutions can encourage the writing and rewriting? And rewriting, I stress on that word, the histories of women artists. Thank you. Thanks, Lina, and so good to see a face with the name. Um, and and you know, I'm I'm starting to feel very old with um, you know the the all the praise. But um, what you have at Madhaf is a wealth of objects that they need to be your point of beginning. And so, and the methodologies should not be there. Should not be one methodology. You know, we teach methodology uh, classes courses for um, graduate and undergraduate uh, students. And I always tell students, you know, don't follow one, don't say I'm going to follow a, a feminist or a Marxist methodology to understand this work of art. Follow whatever you need, because, you know, it's, you shouldn't limit, you shouldn't interpret the work based on a specific methodology, but you should find what methodology helps you understand the work. So for you, in the space where you are, you're able to look at these objects of art and try to start from unfolding, unpacking, understanding what the, the form is telling you, what the object is telling you. And then, of course, now there are many initiatives and many graduate students who are working. I, have, I know two um, students who are here online now who are working on women artists. And so the, the biographies and, and the encyclopedia at Madhaf that I started was specifically another form of, of documentation because we wanted to to, um, uh, write specific uh, standardized names because that was a whole other problem of spelling of names but also um, connect with the works with the artist and their biography and, and larger and larger it was a point of beginning you have that material and I do hope the encyclopedia project continues to grow um, because you know it's a, it's a sad for it to not to but this is your point of beginning 
of moving forward between the object and the, the, the archival material. And we can talk about this later because I have a dictator uh, monitoring us. <laughs> okay, Alessam. Doctora, uh, our final question. Good and, dictator, yes. <laughs> Doctora, our final question uh, is uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Rudha Mumini, uh, who is an Aga Khan fellow at the Department of Art History at Harvard and also at the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. He is now at Cambridge. Uh, Rudha, please quickly, you've got one minute, both of you, to ask and answer a question. Uh, you are highlighted and unmuted. Uh, hi, Neda. It's such a pleasure to see you and listen to you. And I would like to thank also the dictator for organizing this wonderful majlis. I will be very quick. You talk about archives, lack of publication, your initiative in the USA also. But I want to ask you, according to you, what should be done or what are the next uh, steps for the recognition of the field of modern Arab art in US university, but also in Europe and also in the universities of the Arab world? Thank you very much, Sultan. Nice. Rida, so nice to see you. And, you know, Rida and many of you who asked questions are people who are doing some of the steps that uh, need to be done. So Rida's work on, on Tunisia, for example, um, which sort of looked at not just the 19th century, but into the 20th century, creates another sort of aspect of the narrative that is required. I'm happy to say that academic, you know, I mean, I have students who have students now at, um, uh, in academia in the US. So I think to some extent, we are on the right track of establishing an acknowledged form. I mean, I just got elected to the board of CAA, College Art Association. So, you know, um, art, uh, 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 academia in the US acknowledges um, the art of art. We had MoMA publish our book. So, you know, we're doing fine. I think Europe is still lagging, to be honest. Um, um, and, and then a lot of it has to do with funding and with resources. And what, more importantly, we need to figure out how to connect with the region. And many of you who are in the region are already doing that. We just need to sort of try to make a better um, uh, and wider sort of web of connection so we can kind of not work in isolation. So whatever we're doing here in the U.S. is impacted by you as well as in, it impacts you in the region. We need to have this collaboration. We need to do more. All of us need to do more. We should not be afraid of my last words. We should not be afraid of archives. We should not be afraid of being wrong or saying a wrong thing. Thing, or you know, saying that Nada said the wrong thing because here's the new material that I found and this is what she said and now I know better. These things do happen. Scholarship needs to grow. You know, it cannot be limited one story, one thing. That you know, and so and with that we can all kind of help the field grow. Thank you, uh, Doctor. I think this is the very first talk that I take no questions from the comments. And the comments are full of questions and, uh, and I think full of praise for you. If there's one thing I would like is to have a way to clone you and have 200 or 300 Nada Shabbots because we need one or two in every city in the Arab world and beyond. Thank you so much, Doctora, for, uh, for taking the time. Uh, I know it was early uh, in the U.S. there. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, for everything you do, really, endlessly. Thank you endlessly, Doctora. You are such a, a great champion of art from the region. Um, I mean, really, there are no words to express how much we all adore you. I think that's the, the, the smallest word we can use is how much we adore you. And again, we had 240 people uh, sign up, and that's a testament to how popular you are and how loved you are. We hope we all see you soon. Doctora, thank you so much. I'll be sending you the chat uh, questions so that you can follow up with people. And we are also recording this talk. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Doctora. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sultan, very much. And thank you, everyone. And yes, we can continue this conversation via email. Bye-bye.